I'll be reading tonight from John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Uh, these verses are not on the screen. Uh, they are going to be, um, that, that I'm just going to speak them to you, and the idea behind this is, um, instead of trying to read along or anything, you can certainly turn in your Bibles, but I want you to hear them as though you are in the same room with Jesus tonight. John 13, beginning in verse 1 and going to verse 17. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Therefore, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. May God add blessing to this, the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. He looked into my eyes, knowing everything. The secrets I'd kept from him, the ways I'd stolen from him, lied to him. He even knew I was betraying him. But he never rejected me. For three years, I watched him eat with the worst people in society. The sick, the poor, the Romans, the sinners. But last night, he ate with me. Knowing I was betraying him, even while we were eating. As we ate, he warned of a traitor among us. The others were shocked, angry even. I played along, even going so far as to say, surely it's not me, is it? But Jesus leaned in close and he whispered, yes, it's you. I forced a smile through the rest of dinner, though my heart was sick within me. At one point, he, he took a piece of bread, broke it, and compared it to what would happen to him in just a few hours. I swear he looked at me as he said it. Tears formed in his eyes, a subtle plea for me to stop what he knew I was doing. But I didn't stop. I couldn't. Or maybe I just didn't want to, I don't know. But he did. He did know. So why didn't he stop me? Why didn't he fight me on this? Why didn't he save himself from what I was doing? It's why I hated him. But it's also why I loved him. He was the best person I've ever known, far better than I am. And he never gave up on me. He loved me to the very end. Jesus knew what was going on in, in Judas's heart. He saw the deceit and the greed, the evil that was growing inside of Judas. We learned last week that Judas had allowed evil to reign in his heart. Um, but instead of calling him out, Jesus sat with him. Instead of calling him out in front of all the other disciples, exposing him to the rest of them and saying, are you, are you guys going to get him? I mean, let, let's get him, Right? Like, I, I'm on to his plan, totally on to this. He's found out, let's do this. He didn't do it, though. Instead, the Gospel of John tells us that when he knew that the hour was near, Jesus showed all the disciples, including Ju Judas, the full extent of his love. And this was a plan that involved Jesus giving to Judas everything that he had. Everything. Everything. And it all started with a meal. On the Thursday before Jesus died, 
It was the evening of the Passover meal, a meal that faithful Jews celebrate uh, every year to commemorate the day that God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian slavery, from the book of Exodus. You, you may remember this, Ten Commandments, the whole deal. Um, the, the, the story of the Passover is what Christians often uh, recall as, as um, the, the beginning of kind of communion, like the, the beginnings of the meal of communion that Jesus instituted. So they've gathered for this particular meal. This meal involves very specific types of food, bread, and wine. And on this night, Jesus set the table for what would be his last supper with the disciples. Now, many people believe that they have an idea of what the last supper looks like. Um, and, and for most of us, we are informed by this. Um, it's, it's the view of the last supper, Leonardo da Vinci, right? Um, Everybody gathered together on one side of the table like some pretty TV family so everybody's face can be seen. Da Vinci was like, okay, everybody, get on the other side. Um, yeah, I'm going to paint you. He wasn't alive during their time, but you can imagine. Um, <laughs> now, people in the know can, can look at this picture and you can pick out who is who, okay? Obviously, Jesus is in the center, <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> but but you, you can also, people in the know can also pick out Peter and, and John. You can pick out Judas. And, and people that are really in the know can pick out some of the lesser known disciples, um, the ones that we don't really hear about. And you can go through each one of them. Now, there's conspiracy theorists, and they'll say that Mary Magdalene is sitting next to Jesus there. And, and uh, there's a space there for a reason, which is really interesting. Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code kind of talks about that. Um, fiction. It's in the fiction section. Um, <laughs> just feel like I need to say that. But, um, but you know that this is not correct. You, you, you know that this isn't how they sat. Or maybe that you don't. But I'll tell you that this picture is wholly incorrect. It's beautiful. It should hang in art galleries, but it shouldn't be part of history. Instead, a table setting would have looked a little bit more like this. Now, this is a mosaic in a place in a town called Sepphoris. Um, it is just outside of Bethlehem uh, in, in northern Israel. Uh, it was a rich area. In fact, uh, some, some of you may uh, be familiar with the makeup shop, uh, Sephora, comes from Sepphoris, uh, oddly enough. Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> it's very practical, modern, right? Um, Sepphoris um, was a very rich and wealthy place, and in um, some of the, the finer uh, buildings in Sepphoris, they had these beautiful mosaics, and, um, tile floors, and uh, you can see that there, are, um, that there are some kind of empty uh, sort of spaces on the left, and the right, and, and kind of if I'm, I'm standing right here uh, on this side, there would be a, a kind of blank tile where I'm standing. So it forms a U. Well, the reason there's no beautiful mosaic tile in those particular areas is because for great banquets, they would bring out tables to set in those places. Okay? And so since they're going to be covered by tables, why waste the time and the money to put expensive, beautiful tile there? Because they're only going to be seen at great banquets and stuff, so bring out the tiles or the tables. And so the table setups at this time would be in what's known as a triclinium shape. And we've created a triclinium shape for you right here. Now this, oddly enough, they all are going to sit on one side. This is how people would eat during Jesus' day at very, very particular um, banquets. Now, it's not like, you know, having breakfast. They wouldn't sit at a great feast like this. Instead, it would be great, important meals. And you better believe that the Last Supper was one of these important meals. This sort of setup was all the rage in the Greco-Roman world. And remember, as we've talked about the last three weeks, Israel is under Roman occupation. Therefore, they picked up some of their things. This setup, like I said, is called a triclinium, and you're like, okay, well, that's neat, but let's break it down. Triclinium actually stands for something. Uh, tri means what? Three. Oh, Y'all are so smart. College, right? Uh, you've learned things. Tri means th three. Uh, clinium, you probably don't know that. It's from a Greek word, uh, kline, uh, C-L-I-N-E, if we were to uh, make, it, uh, make it more English. Um, but this word is, means couch. It's where we get the word recliner, okay? Ah, oh, yeah. And so the idea is that you have three couches. 
And instead of nice chairs that you sit, you would recline, okay? And so you would lay down at your table, as is the custom, or you would kind of perch. You see that they're kind of on their knees here, um, on pillows and stuff. But typically, people would lay down kind of on their side. I'm actually going to do it here. Um, and they would kind of lean with their left hand, okay? Now, this is a little high to be leaning um, and no pillows, so I don't want to break my legs or hips or anything because I'm old or whatever. But, um, <clears throat> but leaning on the left-hand side, what, what does this do? Well, it frees up your right hand to then eat, okay? You're like, that seems terribly, terribly inconvenient, and yes, it is. Um, <clears throat> very uncomfortable. Why would anyone do that? Well, it was custom, and it wasn't for every meal. It was for very important meals. Now, this is important for a number of reasons, but it's important for us as we approach the Last Supper because we begin to understand some very specific things. I want you to imagine the 12 disciples and Jesus all leaning in on this table, or on these three table, tables, the triclinium, with their left arms in, and eating with their right, or kind of just kind of sidled uh, up to one another all the way around these tables. And as we do this, I want you to imagine John chapter 13. Part of the passage I've already read to you, but some of it, um, I, I'd like to, to, to add on to here. So in John chapter 13, verse 1 and following, um, it says, as we've already read, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. <clears throat> then Lord, <laughs> Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one was clean. Now, foot washing before meals was a common practice during Jesus' day. You, you may have known this. Due to the sandals uh, people wore and the dusty, often unpaved roads that they would walk, uh, day in and day out, uh, it was not uncommon for a person's feet to be caked with dirt and mud and grime. Okay? Pretty disgusting. Which makes sense why at tables like this, we may try to keep our feet as far away from the table as possible. Right? So that's why we are leaning against and putting our feet all the way out there. Now, this is really interesting, I think. Washing feet was typically done by servants, but on this particular night, it's not a servant that does it, it's Jesus, the host, the one that's called this great banquet in this hall. And he does something amazing. He comes over and he takes the water and a basin, and he begins to pour water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now, you can imagine how he does this, right? If they're all laying down, he's coming along behind them and washing their feet, one by one by one, all the way around this table. And he comes to Peter, and Peter objects and says, no, you're not going to do this. And he's like, well, yeah, I am. And they, they bicker for a moment, and then finally he's like, okay. But what I want you to understand here is that Jesus is doing something that Jesus has no business doing. Because, you know, if you believe he's the Son of God, if you believe he's the Savior, the Messiah, or even if you just believe he's the guy in charge of this meal banquet, he has no place doing this. 
He has no, uh, like, this is not what someone of power and authority does. And yet, he does it. Now, we hear about his conversation with, uh, with Peter, but I want you to imagine his conversation with Judas. Right? Because that's got to be an interesting moment. He washes Peter's feet, and there's this great moment um, of, you know, wash my body, whatever, my whole deal. He's like, whatever, just your feet. You don't understand what I'm doing. You'll get it later. But what about the moment that he comes to Judas? What was going through Judas's mind at that point? Was Judas seething with anger at that moment? How dare you wash my feet? Like, this is my biggest problem with you, Jesus. Like, you're always doing things like this instead of what we need you to do. We need you to be powerful. We need you to be mighty. Why are you spending so much time washing our feet, doing the work of servants? We are the servants of Rome, basically. Why don't you do something, Jesus? But he comes to Judas. And he washes, get this, his betrayer's feet. And as he did so, I want you to understand this. He washes the feet that just hours before had stepped into the courts of the chief priests to betray him. Jesus washes off the dirt, the grime, the dust, the sand that Judas had accumulated in the place that he took 30 silver coins to betray Jesus. Jesus washes that dirt off of Judas. Now that is a pretty cool moment. And I wonder if that irony hit Judas at that point. In so doing, Jesus reminded Judas that this was bigger than the washing of the sole of his foot. He wanted to wash his soul clean. This washing of the feet, it reminds us that the Savior washes our sin. It washes all of the gunk, the mire, the junk that we've accumulated in our life. Jesus washes it clean. Following the foot washing, uh, the disciples began their Passover meal together. But before they did that, Jesus had just a few more words about washing feet. Um, Jesus says this, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? And they're all like, no. Um, <clears throat> you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am, he said. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Basically saying, I've washed your feet. I'm telling you now, I am making you clean. Not every one of you is clean. So now that I've done this for you, the ball's in your court, or rather the basin and the towel are in your court. <laughs> Wash one another's feet, because one of you is unclean. And just as I'm reminding you that you are forgiven, you need to remind each other, because there's going to be gunk and grime that's coming in the next 24 hours that I can't help you with at that point. Remind each other to, 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 to buy through this. You are to wash one another. Friends, this is also why we do small groups like we do. Spark groups, I really don't care about you, how you answer the questions and all this kind of stuff. It's not about your opinions and all this kind of the, the goal that we have in small groups, in Phoenix groups, and Ember groups, and all of the different groups that we have around here is so that you can remind each other that you are forgiven, that you can remind each other that you are loved by God. It is a way of metaphorically washing one another's feet because there's a lot of crap that gets on our feet in daily life, doesn't it? Spark groups, Ember groups, Phoenix groups, your small group, and I don't even care if it's part of our official groups, whoever your tribe is, your Christian brothers and sisters, they're the ones that are, to, are able to look you in the eye and say, you are forgiven. You are not defined by the muck and the grime that has accumulated on your soul. And let me tell you, if that's not your small group experience, then you're just not doing small group right. Small groups are supposed to free you up. 
And that's what Jesus is instituting here. As I've washed your feet, wash one another's feet. The supper continues. And what's interesting is, as the supper continues, we're actually given some interesting pieces. Now, I pointed at Leonardo da Vinci's painting earlier, uh, and there's the question of where does everyone sit in that painting. But if I'm like, okay, that's not it, this is it, you might say, well, where does everyone sit there? The good news is, is that the Gospel of John lets us know where everyone sits. Well, at least four people. And so I'm going to be reading from John chapter 13, verse 21 and following. These will be on the screen. And we can kind of decipher where everyone is seated. Now, it's important to note something about the scene here. I've already said that this is a triclinium setup, and, uh, meaning three couches, right? <laughs> Got it? Just making sure we're good on vocab memorization. Um, there will be a test. Um, <laughs> but as you are reclining on your left-hand side, if you are way over here, right, if you're looking at the person next to you and they're leaning on their left-hand side, you're staring where? At their back. You're looking at the back of their head, which automatically puts you in a lesser position than them, all right? And so if you're sitting all the way over here, left hand, right over here, looking, you're looking at this back, who's looking at this person's back, who's looking at this one, so on and so forth, on and on and on, until you get over to this table. Now, what I also want you to know is that there were very specific arrangements for how people would sit at a triclinium setup. Jesus talks about this in some of his uh, parables. For example, in one parable, it says, when you go to a, a great banquet or a feast, take the lowest place at the table. Everybody wants the highest place at the table. Take the lowest place. That way, if the host says, you're in the wrong seat, you'll be invited to come and join the host at a higher place it would be much more embarrassing if you took the higher place. They said, ah, you're in somebody more important than you seat back down the line, right? That explains that parable. Now, what's also interesting is that you've got least important, more important, growing in importance, and then you've got the host's table decked out in very fine red tablecloth tonight because we bougie like that, just like Jesus was. So, Jesus is the host. We know this. We know that Jesus is the host. The host would always sit at the host table right here, right in the middle. And to Jesus' right, or the host's right, we would have a trusted friend. And to the host's left, we would have the most important guest. The most important guest. Why? Because this person's sitting at the host table and is looking at the back of none of the other guests. He's able to look directly at the host, who, oddly enough, is more interested in hosting than following protocol. So the host is going to be sitting there talking to the guest of honor, talking to the others, and then maybe yelling over to the others uh, at, the, at the, the poor table or something, I, the, 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 the lowest of the low over there. The host would always have the right-hand man or woman over here. That way the host could say, um, listen, seat number seven over there needs some more wine. And then without much you know, spectacle, this trusted friend would go and do it. Refill the wine and then come back to the seat. Does that make sense to you? So with that in mind, let's read John chapter 13, verse 21 and following. He says, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Now his disciples, all around the triclinium, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which one of them he meant. And one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. The disciple that Jesus loved, that's John the one that writes the gospel, a little arrogant, but nonetheless. <laughs> and it says that he's reclining next to him, which means that, first of all, he's, he's one of these two. And actually, in this, as it says that he's reclining next to him, 
It says, uh, while he's reclining, Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Now, this is an important piece. Simon Peter is at least far enough away from John to have to motion to him. And so maybe he's over here, or maybe he's like somewhere right here, or maybe he's right here at the absolute lowest, which is kind of interesting, right? Because we would think that Peter, the rock on whom the church is going to be built, would be right next to Jesus. But what an amazing, humbling teaching it would be if Peter who will become you know, this great leader in the early church, was put at the very late, uh, last seat. And so he doesn't want to draw attention, but he sees that he's nowhere near Jesus to be able to ask Jesus himself. So he motions, doesn't say it, but he motions, ask Jesus who's going to betray him. And then it says, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, leans back against Jesus. Well, that lets us know he leans back, which means he's on his left side, he leans back. John is the trusted friend. John's the right-hand guy, which makes sense because he's the disciple that Jesus loved, according to John. So he leans back and he says to Jesus, Lord, who is it? And you can imagine that, right? Lord, who you can tell me. You love me. <laughs> and Jesus answers, only to John. I love this. It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. And then, dipping the piece of bread, he gives it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Do you see that? He, do he doesn't get up. He doesn't make a spectacle. He just says, it's the Pass it over. Which is pretty impressive because that means that Judas is in the seat of honor. And what does that tell us? I think it tells us a lot. This is how it would have looked. In case you missed that. <laughs> I sketched it myself. No, <laughs> I did not. Do you see what's happening here though? Jesus put Judas closest to himself. Why? Because Judas needed him the most. For a long time, lifelong Christians and church people take that seat. They take the seat right next to Jesus. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so close to the Lord. <laughs> Sometimes we go to, to churches and we see that pastors have specific parking spots closest to the door. Sometimes we see that certain pews in churches are designated for big-time givers or lifelong members. But when Jesus hosted the supper, he said the best seat in the house is reserved for the one that's going to betray me because this dinner, yeah, it's for all of you, but it's for him. And it's the last-ditch effort that we've got to save Judas. It teaches us something. We save the best seat in the house for those that need Jesus the most. And sometimes that person that needs Jesus the most is us and we need to get as close to Jesus as possible, which is a good thing because Jesus says, if you need me the most, you've got the best seat in the house. Now, if you're righteous, well, why don't you get over there with Peter? Pick up the water basin, why not? And start washing the feet of people as they're getting closer to me. The conversation continues at dinner. It says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, You have said so. 
Do you hear this? I don't think it's Jesus saying here like arrogantly, proudly, oh, one of you will betray me. It would have been better if he had never been born. Instead, I think it's a plea. I think that he's saying what sometimes we say to ourselves. Jesus is speaking words that Judas and we sometimes say to ourselves. And so in the midst of this meal, where it's already a somber tone, Jesus is reminding us, There are things in life that cause us to face extraordinary pain and guilt, shame, temptation, and lead us away from God. And it can convince us that when we do the unthinkable things, that we are beyond hope. The conversation again continues, and it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all of them, said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And so Jesus gives Judas the bread, and the cup, which is one of my favorite things. When I was a kid, I remember sometimes we would go to church. We weren't really a church-going family, but sometimes we would go to church, and when we went to church, my parents would sometimes be like, oh, man, communion. It's the first Sunday of the month. Maybe we won't go today. Why? Because we don't feel worthy of it. And I imagine that if Judas came to church services, he might not feel worthy of it. The beauty is, though, if you're not worthy of it, this is the seat you belong in. And Jesus wants to make sure that you're offered the grace and the love and the mercy that your heart and soul so desperately crave. My friend um, Sherry Harris, who's a United Methodist minister here in this conference, North Alabama, she tells the story of a man in her congregation years ago who had had a stroke. Defying all the odds, he lived, and he went into rehab. After much work and discipline, the man regained basic motor skills, but it was obvious that his life would never, ever be the same again. After many months, he finally returned to church with his family, and it just so happened to be World Communion Sunday. And it was quite a sight when this man and his family came down to receive communion. It was a great moment because he hadn't been in church in months. So what a great triumphant moment for this man to be able to walk to the pastor to receive communion. However, when he received the bread, as he was about to dip it into the cup, it happened. The whole congregation watched as the man with these shaky fingers began to dip, and he dropped the bread. Not in the cup, just down, and it rolled as if the whole congregation and time stood still. But the pastor, so wise, maybe beyond the years that the pastor had, just smiled, grabbed another piece of bread, and leaned in and said, there's always more grace. Sometimes I wonder, do I believe that? Do I believe that there's always more grace? Because boy, I can beat myself up a lot. There was a time in my life when I really believed that, I don't know, my faith was predicated on the idea that God was very disappointed in me, and because of that, I had to feel guilty all the time. And that's one thing, that's something that, you know, you've got to sort out in your own faith and maybe in counseling and all this kind of stuff. But here's the truth. Jesus says, I have washed your feet, now wash one another's feet. Your understanding of theology and forgiveness and the, 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 the way that you can approach Jesus affects the way that you approach other people. How can I say this? Because I know this. I've said throughout this entire series that one of the biggest reasons that I know 
these, these stories of Judas is because of my dad. When things had gotten so bad with my father, when I was about 24, 25 years old, my parents were finally getting a divorce, 26 years late, in my opinion. And my dad was off the rails, making threats, making all kinds of just warnings to me and my mom and my brother. And he said all kinds of terrible things to us. This is what addiction did to him. It turned him into someone that I never knew. I remember when I was 25 years old, he had called me. And whenever, um, then I lived with my, my best friend and roommate, Ben, old roommate Ben. Whenever dad called me during those days, Ben said, I'm going to go for a drive. <laughs> what a good idea. Because for the next 30 to 45 minutes to an hour, I would be in a screaming match on the phone because that's how bad it was. I remember the last conversation that I had with him when I was 25. He said, Wade, listen to yourself. I said, what are you, what are you getting at? He said, you are a Christian and a pastor at that. How can you say the things that you're saying to me? Because I was not kind to him. I was very angry with him for all the pain and the hurt that he had caused me. He said, how can you say that? You're supposed to represent Jesus which infuriated me. He said, how can you treat me like this if you're supposed to be like Jesus? And my response to him was, if I'm supposed to be like Jesus, then you are my Judas. And at least Judas had the kindness and respect for Jesus to go ahead and kill himself afterwards. I hung up with him and that was the last I spoke to my dad for a very long time. What that told me about me is that I had a view of God that was not this. That was not this idea that Jesus doesn't give up on people. Fortunately, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus extended grace to Judas because there's always more grace even in the moment of betrayal, even in the worst thing. It's not the last thing for Jesus. And the good news is that he does it for us as well. There's grace when you deserve it and when you don't because you don't deserve it and neither do I. When you don't deserve it, when you can't deserve it, when you will never deserve it. When you feel like life will never be the same, when you feel like you should have never been born, there's grace when you feel like Peter and when you feel like Judas. John 13, 27 through 30. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him and Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. And as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was nighttime. It was night. Yeah, it was dark. It wasn't just a time of day, it was darkness. And you can imagine that Jesus says these things, and he watches Judas go, and I imagine Jesus sitting here, watching the guest of honor at this meal go to do what he's decided to do, and Jesus is fighting back tears the whole time. And then he speaks these words in the very next verse. Don't miss this. Judas leaves. And what's the first thing that he says to the other disciples? He sa it says, when he was gone, when Judas had left, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and he will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Listen to the command. Judas has just left. He says, love one another. Why does he say it? Because for the next 24 hours, Judas is going to need that. 
He's not going to need people saying, you betrayed him, you denied him, get out of here. And so Jesus is pleading with the rest of the 11. He's saying, love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Later that night, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prays this prayer. While I was with them, I protected them. I protected them and kept them safe by the name that you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus prays for the disciples and for Judas. Doomed for destruction? Yeah, because of his actions. Jesus did everything that he could, but sometimes there's no changing the mind of somebody. We are like Judas, and Jesus treats us the same way. Following that prayer, Jesus took the remaining disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. His 11th hour had begun, and so had Judas's. Tonight, though, as we close this time of worship, we remember that the meal that Jesus extended to Judas is also extended to us. Jesus took bread, broke it, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He says to Judas, this is my body that you are breaking. And in the same way, I've never betrayed Jesus for 30 silver coins, but I have denied and betrayed Jesus for a lot of other things. I've broken his body. Jesus took the cup, gave it to Judas, and said, this is my blood, which is shed both by you and for you. And we do this tonight in remembrance of the mighty act of Jesus Christ. Tonight, in a moment, you're going to be invited to receive communion after our prayer. However, I don't want you to just come up here and it's not going to be somebody standing up here giving you a piece of bread and giving you the cup. No, this is going to be on, it's going to be a more personal journey. I invite every one of you to come forward and first of all, take this and remember that Jesus can wash the grime and the muck and the dirt and the sin off your soul and just pour this on your hand. Feel the water and ask Jesus once again to help you remember forgiveness. And then I want you to walk slowly around remembering what it would be like to be every one of these disciples. And then when you come to the host's table, remember that it's not one of the pastors here that gives this to you, but it's Jesus himself. Every time we do communion, I'd like for you to kneel. I want you to take a piece of bread, dip it into the cup, and remember. Remember that you're invited as the guest of honor to receive the love, the grace, the forgiveness, the cleansing of God. The worst thing in your life is not the last thing. Judas believed that the worst thing was the last thing. But that doesn't have to be your story. Let's pray together. God, forgive us.